It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor. Coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. I want to begin by uh, telling you a little story. Uh, more than 30 years ago, when I was a baby Christian, I was hitchhiking in Southern California. I don't even remember where I was going, but I do remember I was picked up by uh, a matronly lady, very nice, and uh, she quickly shared with me that she was a Christian. And before she dropped me off at the next on-ramp where I was going, she said, my house is not far from here. Can I get you some lunch? I thought that'd be very nice. Took me to her home, fed me a nice sandwich or something. And, and she said, now I need to ask you, have you received the Holy Spirit? And I said, uh, no one had ever asked me that before because I just was a new Christian. I'd accepted Jesus up in, in the cave. And, and uh, I said, well... I believe I have because, you know, the Lord had been giving me victory over my bad language and s drugs and these different things. And she said, no, 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 I'm not talking about that. She said, I want to know, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do you speak in tongues? And I said, no. She said, well, then you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And she launched into a Bible study that to me seemed a little bit uh, out of balance with what I was reading in the Bible. And it wasn't long after that I began to worship. I was not part of this church. I began to worship with a variety of different uh, churches, mostly charismatic churches in Southern California in Palm Springs that practiced the speaking of tongues the way it is done in about 50% of the churches in North America with these ecstatic utterances. And I just did not have peace even though I had a lot of friends there, lovely people, that it was what I was finding when I read the Bible. And so I really delved into a study on this subject and, and was very surprised by what I learned. Now, this is something I think we need to address because it is permeating Christianity. A misunderstanding of this doctrine is not only influencing the one subject of the one gift of the Spirit dealing with tongues, but a lot that it also involves is coming into many of the mainline Protestant churches. Now before we go to our, our study, uh, I want you to put on your seatbelt. The message today is dealing with uh, understanding tongues. Uh, this is becoming very common and pervasive in not only Protestant but charismatic churches across North America. Uh, the message today dealing with the subject of understanding tongues, I, I thought it was important to share with you because elements of these things are spreading, they're becoming more accepted, and they're even coming into our church. And I think we need to understand the spirit behind what's going on here. Let me read something to you. This is from the book Second Selected Messages, if you want to write that down. Second Selected Messages, page 35, 36, 38. The Lord desires to have in His service order and discipline, not excitement and confusion. The Lord has shown me what would take place just before the close of probation. Every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. There will be, she's speaking about in the context of a church service, there will be shouting with drums, music, dancing. The senses of rational beings will become so confused they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. A bedlam of noise shocks the senses and perverts that which if conducted aright might be a blessing. The powers of satanic agencies blend with the din of noise to have a carnival and this is termed the Holy Spirit's working. Those things which have been in the past will be in the future. Satan will make music a snare by the way in which it is conducted. And so here it is saying that just before the close of probation which precedes the second coming, these things are going to be reintroduced and this was a message written to God's people, to God's church. Well friends, that day is coming but it's not, not done. It's going to get worse I think. 
these things are happening. Some of you know about the cuckoo bird. We've all heard about the cuckoo bird and cuckoo clocks. But the cuckoo bird is known as a brood parasite. See what they do is they don't incubate their own eggs. What the cuckoo bird it will do, and it's sort of tragic in nature, it will go and lay its egg in the nest of another bird like a reed warbler or something. And they even somehow manage to counterfeit the look of their egg, but you can see the cuckoo bird's egg is much bigger. But then it's one of the great tragedies of nature. When that cuckoo bird hatches out, often before the other birds, it begins to push the other eggs out of the nest, or even worse still, it hatches out and it basically eats all the food because they're so much bigger. And here I think you've got another picture. Here you've got a, a pasture bird working itself to death trying to feed this uh, robust little cuckoo chick that has starved the other chicks out of the nest. And this poor mother doesn't even realize it's not her egg. It's not her chick. It's been introduced. It's called a brood parasite. Counterfeit. Brought in. Becomes a big distraction. The next thing you know the other birds are crowded out while this one bird is stuffed. The devil has laid an egg in the church that is being fed and nursed and it's displacing the other gifts of the Spirit. It becomes a big distraction. And it becomes a counterfeit for the real Holy Spirit. Now I need to be very gentle. The greatest part of Christ's true followers are in the fellowship of other churches. I do not believe the greatest part of Christ's true followers happen to be in my denomination. I believe that God has true followers in many different persuasions. But his sheep are being called out of Babylon. And by the way, do you know where Babylon gets its name? Babylon gets its name because man wanted to kind of make a monument to himself. It became worship of its own entity. And God confused the languages, and that's where you get the word Babylon in Babylon. And one of the primary characteristics of Babylon is a confusion of tongues. Did you hear that? I mean, if you can know anything about prophecy, one of the things in Babylon is this confusion of tongues. And so uh, I may say more about that later. Before I talk about some of the confused gifts of the Spirit, I want to explain what the true is. God does give His people and His church gifts of the Spirit for the purpose of sharing the gospel. For instance, read in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8. Therefore He says, when He ascended on high, He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. When we are married to Christ through baptism, we get a wedding gift. That's the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That gift manifests itself different ways. There are a number of gifts of the Spirit. For instance, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. God gives everybody who becomes His child various gifts of the Spirit for the purpose of ministering for Christ. That Christ might operate through you. And it goes on to say here, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Tongues is one of the gifts of the Spirit. But it is not the only gift. The gift of tongues represents a language. Now, if we're going to understand what the genuine gift of tongues is, it's probably a good idea for us to uh, read what Jesus says here in uh, Matthew chapter 28. The Lord told the disciples, Go ye and teach all nations. Go to all nations. Preaching in the name uh, of the, or baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In order for them to fulfill the Great Commission and go to all the world, they would need some kind of an additional gift. Because of the twelve apostles, how many of them were Jewish? 100%. What did they speak? Hebrew, Aramaic. They probably understood some Latin because they did have the Romans occupying them. Maybe a little bit of Greek because the Greeks had occupied a few years earlier. Here in California, we typically speak English. But if you're smart, you're going to be learning Spanish. 
right? So, I mean, you know, we, you have different cultures that have different influences, but if you're in Sacramento, it's a good idea to understand a little bit of Russian. How many of you know that? <laughs> Big Russian community here. Well, they did have some words and phrases they understood, but they principally spoke Aramaic. Now Jesus said, go teach the whole world. How is he going to get these bright but mostly uneducated men to preach the gospel in all the world? Mark chapter 16 verse 17 tells us what he would do. These signs, Mark 16, 17, these signs shall follow those that believe. In my name they'll cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Now notice something here. Jesus said it would be a sign, a supernatural sign. Now some of you here, how many, I just want to see, how many of you are bilingual? You speak more than one language. Some of you speak Spanish, some Russian, some Romanian, some Filipino, or one of the many dialects, I should say, of the Philippines. Uh, there's a lot of different, we got an international cosmopolitan church here. We got some people who speak Fijian, some who speak Samoan. Uh, some of you speak three or more languages. That's not really what Jesus is talking about. He compares this gift of tongues with casting out devils and taking up serpents. It is a supernatural ability to speak tongues for the purpose of spreading the gospel. Now if you're wondering what the gift of tongues is, the best examples are given in the book of Acts. You look at the story at Pentecost. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. This was our scripture reading this morning. There are three, how many? Three examples of speaking in tongues in the Bible. Not four, there are only three examples of this happening. Some people think every time you're filled with the Holy Spirit you speak with tongues. The Bible does not teach that. There are 18 times in just the New Testament, how many times? 18 times in the New Testament when people were filled with the Holy Spirit. Only three out of those 18 was it connected with tongues. The other times they were simply preaching the Word. And I'll give you some examples of that in a little, uh, a little further on. Acts chapter 2 verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. All right. The day of Pentecost was a holiday that took place 50 days. Penta means five. We've got a pentagon. It's a building with five sides. A pentagram. It's got five sides to it, right? Or the pentagon does. Pentagram something different. It's a five-sided star. So it represents five 50 days after Passover was a Jewish holiday called Pentecost. There were three primary feasts where if you were a dedicated Jew and you could make it, you would travel over land and sea to get to Jerusalem for those feasts. The most desirable feast to go to was the Feast of Pentecost because the weather was perfect for traveling. There was already some food beginning to appear in the fields. And so Jewish boys from the age of 12 up to 90, if they could make it, if they could afford it, would come from all over the Roman Empire to Jerusalem for Pentecost. Now this is only a short time after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or after the ascension of Jesus. Jesus did not tell the disciples at first to go to the world at large. He said, you'll receive the Holy Spirit and I want you to start preaching in Jerusalem and Judea, those are Jewish, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the earth. But they were to begin not going to the Gentiles, but going first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were not commanded to go to the Gentiles until the stoning of Stephen and the supreme court of the Jewish nation plugged their ears and rejected that wonderful presentation of the gospel. So during Pentecost, Jews came from all over the Roman Empire, but they didn't all speak Jewish. Listen. Now suddenly there came from heaven the sound of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the house where they were all sitting. Then there appeared unto them divided tongues, cloven tongues of fire, and it sat on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues. What does the word tongues mean? Languages. As the Spirit gave them utterance. In other words, the Holy Spirit would inspire different ones to speak different tongues and share a message about Jesus and the gospel. Now there were dwelling, there were abiding or camping in Jerusalem, Jews who, they weren't going to the Gentiles yet, devout men out of, these were the Jews who were devoted enough to come to the annual feast. 
devout men out of every nation under heaven. Jews had been dispersed all over the world, not only because of the Romans, but because of the Greeks. They were merchants and they were entrepreneurs and travelers and they were all over the Roman Empire. My mother was Jewish. She didn't speak Jewish. She spoke American. And my grandparents who had come, they were in New York, but they're Jewish families. They spoke Yiddish, which was sort of a, a corruption of, of German and Russian and Polish. And uh, going back then, my great-grandfather, he spoke Russian. He was Jewish, didn't speak Hebrew. The Jews all over the world today speak the language of the country and where they live. And so you can say you're Jewish, which is a nationality, but it's also a religion. And you may not even speak your native tongue. So God is getting ready to do something brilliant here. There were devout Jews dwelling in Jerusalem. They're there for the Feast of Pentecost from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together. They heard the mighty rushing wind and all the crowd came near the upper room and there must have been a courtyard present. And they were confused because everyone heard them, the disciples, speak in his own language. They were all amazed and they marveled and they said to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? That means they spoke the language of the Galileans, which was Aramaic. How is it that we hear each man our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from both Rome, Jews, proselytes. These are converts to Judaism who weren't even Jewish by blood, the proselytes. Cretans and Arabians. Listen, we hear them babbling incoherently ecstatic utterances. We hear them uttering all kinds of gibberish. We don't know what they're saying. That's not what they said. We hear them speaking in our languages, our tongues, the wonderful works of God. Did they know what they were saying? They were speaking real languages of the world for the purpose of preaching the gospel. Now you think about this, this was really a brilliant thing for the Lord to do. What is the fastest way to disperse the gospel around the Roman Empire? Romans had built the roads and the best way those roads were used was for the gospel is you got these devout Jews who'd come to worship, not just any Jews, the devout ones. They're ready to accept Jesus. They're looking for the Messiah. They've got a sense of expectation. They've come to worship. The Holy Spirit is poured out. They hear the roaring, the rushing. They hear this commotion. They come to this courtyard by this upper room and the disciples come out on the roof and they begin to preach. And they gather together in groups and they begin to speak to the different groups that are assembled in the tongues that they understood. You see, when man rebelled against God, he cursed their tongues and it became confusion and babbling. When the Holy Spirit was poured out, it reversed the confusion. Now there's comprehension. They understand the story of Jesus being the Messiah. Thousands were converted during that week, 3,000 then, 5,000 a few days later. They then go away from the feast. They fan out across the Roman Empire. They take back to their respective countries, the truth that the Messiah had come, his name was Jesus. So the Jews were the first ones to spread the gospel around the world because they heard it in their own tongue. The Lord had to do something miraculous to give them that ability to be able to preach the gospel everywhere, right? That's the gift of tongues. What you're seeing in millions of churches around the world masquerading as the gift of tongues is really rank paganism that has found its way in to the church and has caused confusion. And again I want to emphasize good people, dear people, some of them are here today. I know some are listening that have come out of these churches like myself that are being confused by this. So is it clear as you read Acts chapter 2 what the gift of tongues was? Jesus said, I want you to tell the whole world. You don't speak the languages. In one generation the gospel went to the then civilized world. The greatest jump start of the gospel was when God poured out the Spirit. He gave them the supernatural ability to speak in languages they did not formally know. There were 12 apostles plus 120 total in the upper room. They spoke. There's 16 different language groups mentioned just in chapter 2. At least those 16 different language groups were represented that the disciples could speak in. I bet you we got over 16 language groups in this church right now, right? 
Praise the Lord, most of you speak English also. But wouldn't it be wonderful if the Holy Spirit was poured out and we could all go back to our native countries and bring the truth the way they did. You know what I'm saying? This is what happened. So it was a perfect way for the Lord to do it. Now I said there's three examples of speaking in tongues in the Bible. The other example is Cornelius. And I'm not going to have time to read all these in depth. If you read in Acts chapter 10, you'll read where Cornelius was a Roman centurion. Now the gospel's going to the Gentiles. This is after the stoning of Stephen. Peter goes to this house. It's the first time he's preaching to a Gentile. Cornelius is a centurion from the Italian band. What language do you think they spoke? Latin, Italian, right? He's got servants in his household. The servants in the Roman Empire were, could be from anywhere. They spoke other languages. Peter, who speaks Jewish now, is being invited by the servants in Cornelius' household to go and angel said, Peter's going to come and he's going to teach to you. Peter begins to talk. They understand partially what he's saying. It's not their native tongue. While Peter is preaching about Jesus in Aramaic, the Holy Spirit falls upon them. Verse, uh, Acts chapter 10 verse 44, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. Those who were of the circumcision which believed were astonished because as many as came with Peter, the, the Jews who had come, were surprised that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost for they heard them speak with tongues. That means they understood them speaking with tongues and magnify God. That means they could understand what they were saying in those tongues. They were magnifying God. They weren't just babbling. Does that make sense? The same way the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 10 is the same gift that you find in Acts chapter 2. If you don't believe Pastor Doug, you read in verse 15, Peter, and this is chapter 11 of Acts, Acts chapter 11 verse 15. You might want to look that up. When Peter reports back to the council in Jerusalem how God is now sending the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles, listen to what Peter says. The Holy Ghost fell on them as it fell on us at the beginning. So what kind of gift of tongues do they get in Acts chapter 10? Something new? A new variety? Or is it the same kind of gift of tongues Peter says that we had at the beginning? Right? It's languages that could be understood. Then you've got the third example of speaking in tongues that you're going to find in uh, Acts chapter 19. This also is a place where it talks about uh, rebaptism. The twelve Ephesian disciples. We all know that Jesus had twelve Jewish disciples. Do you know after the gospel went to the Gentiles, you find a story where there's 12 Gentile disciples. Acts 19, Paul preaches to these uh, 12 Ephesians who were baptized by John the Baptist. They had not heard the story about Jesus yet. He preaches to them about Jesus. He lays hands upon them. I'm in Acts 19 verse 6. The Holy Ghost came on them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now what does prophesied mean? means they preached. Prophesied doesn't mean you walk around giving uh, astrological fortune cookies. Uh, prophesied means that you preach. And so could they understand what they were saying in these tongues? Yeah, it says they were prophesying. They were preaching. Were there different language groups present? You've got Paul, you've got Luke, you've got Ephesians. So there's several language groups that are present there. They needed the gift of tongues. They recognized there was a difference of tongues. The very fact that Luke doesn't say the Holy Spirit fell on them a whole different way. They got a different kind of gift of tongues. He doesn't say that. Which means it's the same kind of gift of tongues that you saw in Acts chapter 10 and that you saw in Acts chapter 2. There you have it friends. We've looked at all of the examples of speaking in tongues in the Bible. And nowhere do you see an example of this incoherent muttering and babbling where the person speaking may not even know what they're saying. There is a counterfeit that has been introduced. For every truth of God, for every truth of God, Satan has a counterfeit. Is there counterfeit love? Is there a counterfeit for uh, the Holy Spirit? You can bet there is. Does God have a counterfeit law? Counterfeit Sabbath? He's got counterfeits, uh, the devil I mean. The devil's got a counterfeit for every truth of God. Shouldn't surprise us that he not only has a counterfeit for tongues. There's a true gift of tongues. I want to reiterate, I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in miracles. I believe in healing. I believe in casting out devils. I believe in prophecy. I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. But there's been a, uh, 
a cuckoo bird egg that's been laid in the church. That is not the gift of tongues. And it has confused a lot of people. And you know what breaks my heart? While I was studying and preparing for this last night, I read the testimony of one young lady who said, I have become an atheist because I grew up in a church where they did the most bizarre things and she was referring to this common practice of babbling incoherently, the out of control behavior and she said, I just couldn't believe that that was God. And so she's given herself to atheism, young lady. A lot of people have been turned away from Christianity because God says, come now let us reason together. God is not the author of confusion the pandemonium and the bedlam and the cacophony of noise that's done in the name of the Lord. That's why here at Central we often make a big deal about reverence in worship. God is orderly. And I think that there ought to be respect. I like it when you say amen. That's good. And you're just saying we, you know, agree. But there's communication. Now I'm going to get more into the process of that. But even by definition, um, Glossolalia, it comes from, this is this popular ecstatic utterance, the babbling that they call speaking in tongues. Um, it's a combination of two words, glossia, which means language and then to speak, or tongues and then to speak. According to the American Heritage Dictionary, it is fabricated and non-meaningful speech, especially such scene associated with a trance state or certain schizophrenic syndromes. That's not me. It's not my church. This is the American Heritage Dictionary. What is a language? According to the same dictionary, the language is the use by human beings of voice sounds, often written symbols representing these sounds in organized combinations with patterns in order to express and communicate those thoughts and feelings. By any definition, the disjointed, repetitive a gibberish that you often hear is not a language. Matter of fact, I can't remember their names right now, but a couple of gentlemen wrote some books and have done some studies on this uh, phenomenon that is spread through the Protestant and Catholic churches of speaking in tongues where they recorded somebody speaking in tongues. And then they took this to linguists from a number of different countries, experts in studying languages and articulation. And they said, what language is this? And all of them came back with the same conclusion. They said, this couldn't be any language, earthly or otherwise, because most of it is rep repeating words and there is no sequence, no system to it that would communicate any kind of organized thought. It doesn't meet the definition of language. Now I have some quotes that this is from the New York Times, a recent article dealing with the subject of tongues. Uh, the Catholics were quite worried a, a few years ago. An estimated 1.3 million Latino Catholics have given up the Roman Catholicism and embraced Pentecostalism since immigrating to the United States. Well, one way that, that they've compensated now, the Catholic churches are welcoming uh, speaking in tongues in their church. They find it doesn't really conflict with most of their doctrines and so they figure, you know, better join them than lose them. And so a number of Catholic churches are now charismatic churches. Um, go on to the next slide here. Someone who is speaking about this. Speaking in tongues is a controversial practice to many Christians, but others consider it a gift from God. Uh, continue. And many people who attend the Freedom Valley Worship Center in Gettysburg, this is one church, that they picked out. Pray for that gift. This is in Gettysburg, uh, Pennsylvania. For me, it's almost as if I'm able to tap into God's heart and what he wants, said Amber Crone, a member of the church. I don't really know what I'm saying, but I know it's what God wants me to say and to speak. You can feel him. I want you to notice the emphasis on feeling. You can feel him all around you. You can feel him speaking through the words that you are saying. Next like Crone's friend Kelly describes what she says is a feeling of connection to God. I know some people get a warm fuzzy feeling going on inside. For me, I get goosebumps. Actually, are goosebumps a feeling too? So much of it is not dealing with spiritual enlightenment of truth that sets you free. It's all actually very basic and carnal. And you might wonder, how did it find its way into the church? In virtually every pagan religion of the world, you find this dynamic. Uh, it can be traced back, for instance, to the Oracle of Delphi in Greece. And you know the Greeks had, 
had uh, conquered the then civilized world, that um, people would go to this place, and there's an actual picture of the ruins of the Oracle of Delphi, and the whole cult religion was developed around this. And if people weren't wanting a message from the gods, they would go and consult the oracle. Have you heard that term before? And what would happen is they would go through, the priest would go through these incantations and there was a priestess there who was called a Sibyl or the, um, a, a Pythia. And uh, that's where you get the word to say something in a pithy way. She would inhale these vapors that were intoxicating, go into a trance, the music would be playing, the drums would be beating, she would begin to utter these ecstatic gibberish utterings and then the priest would interpret them. And uh, matter of fact, I think I've actually got a, a quote here that explains from the uh, dictionary um, or the encyclopedia how this worked. I, I've told you I've got a lot of information. Let me see if I can find this real quick. Here, here we go. While exhilarating music was playing, the chief priestess named the Pythia would breathe intoxicating vapors and go into a frenzied trance and then begin jabbering. The weird sounds of the priestess muttered were then interpreted by the priest who spoke in verse. Her utter utterances were regarded as the words of Apollo, but the messages were so ambiguous they could seldom be proven wrong. That's from Compton's Encyclopedia. Well, you know, we found this a lot in uh, the churches I used to worship. I'll tell you another little study that was done by these same gentlemen from New York who did a, the study on tongues. They took an excerpt of somebody speaking in tongues in a worship service, got a clear recording, and they went to a hundred different charismatic ministers that believe that they had the gift of tongues. And they went under the guise of, we're Christians and we got a recording of someone speaking in tongues and we'd like to know what this message is. They played the tape. And the pastor would say, oh, this is the Lord. And he'd say what the message was and they'd write it down. They took the same tape of someone speaking in tongues to a hundred different ministers. Guess how many different interpretations there were? One hundred different interpretations. Which makes it a very dubious or suspicious gift. And yet, so many people, dear people, and bright people, and you know, they used to call them holy rollers. They used to say it was the uneducated. Oh, I haven't given you all the history. This is very common when I work with the Navajos in uh, North America. They would eat peyote, hallucinogenics. They would go into a sweat lodge. They would beat the drums all night long. We could hear them from our mission station. They'd go into a trance. They'd begin muttering and jabbering and they said it was the language of the gods. In Africa, very common. I've been there beating the drums all night long we could hear them. And they'd finally get worked into a frenzy, they'd go into a trance, they'd be possessed, they'd say they're possessed by the gods and begin jabbering and, and, and babbling. And, and the truth is, when many of the African slaves came to North America and the Christian missionaries would give them just the basics of the gospel, many of them couldn't read English. And they talked to them about tongues, they'd say, oh we know what that is, we had that back home and they began to introduce the pagan concept of tongues into their Christian worship. And it was at first just among the slaves. Then it found its way through the south among the poor. Then it found its way to LA on what they called Azusa Street and it became more mainline. Then it went from just the Pentecostal churches and the Assembly of God churches into the Methodist churches, the Baptist churches, the uh, Presbyterian churches, the Episcopal churches and it began to spread. But what you've got is it's a pagan trance. These people are dear people and they just have been swept up in this thing that, and it feels good. I don't question whether they're feeling something. I don't question whether a spirit's coming over them. But if the devil was going to counterfeit the Holy Spirit and he was going to try and market it, would he want you to feel bad or would he want you to feel good? I mean, who would want to do it if he didn't feel good? So is that our criteria? What's our criteria to measure whether something's true or not? What does the Bible say? I've got another quote here from the research, this is also from the New York Times. Researchers at the University of Pennsylvania took brain images of five women while they spoke in tongues and found that their frontal lobes, 
the thinking willful part of the brain through which people control what they do were relatively quiet as were the language centers. And here we've got actual pictures of the MRIs you can see for yourself. They're, they're posted online from the study. The, the language centers of the brain and the frontal lobes were very quiet, meaning that this gift of tongues was not coming from the cognitive part, but more the animalistic feeling part of the brains. That, that would make it suspect. And some of the people that go into this trance of tongues, they're speaking in tongues, they say, well, I don't know what I'm saying. It's, it's a prayer language. Now the Bible says that when you speak you should make what you say clear. Let's uh, go back to some of these principles here. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians and we're going to look at uh, some of the verses that talk about the gift of tongues. Just turn to 1 Corinthians and, and I'm going to address this a little bit. Start with though chapter 14 for instance. He talks quite a bit here about the gifts of the Spirit. Matter of fact, if you've got your Bible open to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, go up one verse to the last verse of chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. Oh, I want chapter 12, verse 31, sorry. But earnestly desire the best gifts, and I show you a more excellent way. He says we should desire the best gifts, best gifts of the Spirit, okay? Now go to chapter 14, verse 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you might prophesy. So of the gifts that we should desire, what gift does Paul say that we should especially focus on? Prophecy. And prophecy, like I said, it's not talking about you're going around like Elijah or John the Baptist making predictions. Prophecy here in 1 Corinthians is a Greek word means to speak in behalf of someone else. Means to preach or to share, to teach for Christ. The gifts of prophecy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God for no one understands him. However in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Okay we got to stop here and explain something. Most of what Paul says about tongues is in 1 Corinthians. No, all of what Paul says about tongues is in 1 Corinthians. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. He only talks about tongues in one book, not even in 2 Corinthians. Matter of fact, Matthew never mentions tongues. John never mentions tongues. Luke never mentions tongues except in Acts. He doesn't in his gospel. Peter never mentions tongues. James never mentions tongues. And yet in spite of the silence of all these other Bible writers, if you go to many charismatic churches, you would think that that was all they talked about. And when the gifts of the Spirit are listed, they typically turn the list upside down where he talks about the most important gift is prophecy, the least important is tongues. Now back to Corinth. Corinth was a booming new baby church that Paul had planted. It's a seaport in the Roman Empire where it was a melting pot of people and slaves from all over the Roman Empire. Uh, some of them had come from northern Africa and some of them had maybe come from India, some of them had come from Spain and from Carthage and they were from all over. Their services were often very confusing because there were people from all over the world and they all spoke different languages. Now I've been in churches like that where you not only have the mother tongue of the people that you're with but you've got other primary tongues and nobody wants to totally feel left out and so you got some people there who might speak English and some people there who might speak Korean and some speak Chinese and some speak Mandarin. And so during the services they'll have the guest speaker, everyone wants to know what's being said. I see it happening here at Central almost every week. I'll see somebody leaning over to a brother or sister that speaks almost only Spanish or only, almost only Romanian or some other language and they're trying to whisper quietly to that person while I teach. And that's great because otherwise you know what has to happen is I'd say something in English, somebody else would be here and they'd have to then say it in Japanese, then a third person would have to say it in, in the Korean and someone else would have to say it in Ma Mandarin. And so the services in Corinth were getting very confusing because people were standing up whether there was a translator, an interpreter or not and they were preaching and praying and praising God and testifying. What good would it do you right now if I should start preaching the rest of the sermon in a language you don't understand? Would God understand if it was a language of the world? Would He understand? Yeah. So I'm speaking mysteries in the Spirit. It's not profiting you. This is what was happening. 
That's what Paul is talking about. Once you understand that at the outset, it all makes sense and it falls into place. He's chastising this church for their speaking without organization in their services and languages that people couldn't understand. They were preaching and praying in some of their tongues that they'd received. Some might have been normal languages they grew up learning. Others they might have received miraculously. It doesn't matter. The people listening didn't understand. Keep in mind at the day of Pentecost it was not the gift of hearing. It was the gift of speaking. They were not ears of fire that landed on their heads. They were tongues of fire. Is that right? But they didn't have the gift of hearing. It was a gift of speaking in other languages. So that's why Paul said it was so important that when you do speak in tongues the people there know what it is that you're saying. Now if there's anything that's clear from 1 Corinthians 14 it's that he wants them to understand what others are saying. Let me just give you a couple of high points because we're, we're moving right along here. For instance, verse 7, even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless there's a distinction in the sound, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare himself for battle? Let me see if I, oh bless your heart, okay. Thank you very much. Now who's, the, I want to really find out who owns this. Do I have, I brushed my teeth before I started preaching. Can I use this? You trust me? You might need to sterilize just in this. <laughs> all right. If I was going to ask you to all sing along with me, would you be willing? Okay. I think you'll recognize this number. No? All right. Let me see. If I was to do... All right, you know, that, I played a lot more of that one, but if I were to go... How many notes did I play? Did you recognize it? Yeah. Why? Because there's some organization and distinction to it, right? But what happens in these churches all the time? There's no organization or distinction. They don't know what's being said. Paul said, uh, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, I didn't have a trumpet, I didn't think to bring one, thank you. If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who will prepare for the battle? When I used to go to military school, every morning over the PA speaker, we would hear <laughs> that was a sound. Nobody made any announcement, but we knew what that meant. Then at the end of the day, we'd hear See, I can play trumpet without a trumpet. <laughs> and that would mean go to bed. Or if they were going to chart, no, that's not chart. <laughs> that means charge. And so, but back then they didn't have walkie-talkies for the soldiers. When they're directing troops on the field, they used a trumpet. Can you imagine if you had some schizophrenic trumpeter? And, and the general is saying, okay, tell him flank left, charge. And all of a sudden he decides, you know, I'm just going to let the spirit lead. <laughs> and there's an indistinct sound. So what is Paul saying? There needs to be a distinction in the sound or who's going to know what's being piped or harped. Are you seeing in some of the churches something being done called tongues and there's no distinction in the sound? You don't know what's being said. Listen here. Verse 14. Oh wait, wait, wait. Verse 9. Underline this. If you forget everything about 1 Corinthians 14, don't miss this verse and you won't be confused. So likewise, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? You will be speaking into the air. Bingo. Slam dunk. This is what Paul is saying in this book. Oh, this, I could go on here. Therefore, if I don't know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks is a foreigner to me. Even so, if you're zealous of spiritual gifts, let it be for the edifying of the church. It's got to build people up so they understand what's saying. What's being said, but a lot of my dear friends that speak in tongues, 
they, they just start babbling and say, well, this is a, a heavenly prayer language. Some, some are confused about the idea of praying in tongues. Have you heard that before? They say, oh yeah, Pastor Doug, we agree completely with Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 19 that those were languages of the world for the purpose of preaching the gospel. But there's another gift of the Spirit that's praying in tongues. And this is, you know, the groanings that cannot be uttered, spoken of in Romans, where you don't know how to pray and so you start to babble and it's just release and the Holy Spirit comes over and you pray. First of all, how can you call it a tongue if it doesn't communicate any thought? Secondly, if you're praying and you don't know what you're praying, how are you going to ever know if that prayer was answered? It's not even meeting the definition of tongue. It doesn't meet the definition of prayer. They take one verse. They say, well, Paul prayed in the tongue of angels. Oh, really? Turn with me back to 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Did Paul speak with the tongue of angels? Well, let's find out. He says, though. Some of you have different translations. Does it say if? Some of you got translations there like New American Standard, New Revised Standard. It says if. Notice, if you read on, for instance, verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. Wait a second. Did Paul understand all mysteries and have all knowledge? Does any man? He says, though. What does though mean? Even if. And he says, and though I have all faith so I can remove mountains. Did Paul have all faith? No, he's saying even if. And though I give all my goods to feed the poor. Well, he did have his tent sewing equipment. And though I give my body to be burned, he didn't. He was beheaded. He's saying even if, even if, even if, even if. If I don't have love, it's nothing. So the first verse is also an even if. Even if I spoke with the tongues of men and angels. He's not saying he speaks with the tongue of angels. And yet they take that verse and say, this is the heavenly prayer language, the tongue of angels. Go back now to chapter 14 again, verse 14. They'll take what Paul says here, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. They say, see, I don't even know what I'm praying here. I'm, it, my understanding is, is unfruitful. Let me, let me reword this. Let me translate this into American how this would be better understood. If I pray in a language those around me do not understand, I might be praying with the Spirit, but my thoughts are unfruitful to those listening. For instance, there's probably a couple of you here that speak a little bit of Hebrew. I only remember one prayer in Hebrew, and I'm sure I don't even say it right. It's, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech olam motzi lecha mena orts. I think it's the prayer over the wine could be the prayer over the bread. Oh, I didn't get it right. Close enough. In any event, you didn't know what I said, right? The idea was that I'm praying, I might know what I'm saying, but my understanding is unfruitful to you. Paul is not saying that he didn't know what he was praying. He says, when, I, when I'm praying in the Spirit, you don't understand what I'm saying. It's unfruitful to those around. Sometimes when you translate from one language to another, there's words that you need to add to complete the thought. And so friends, what's happening now is here in the church in the last days, there's a great counterfeit that's found its way into the church. Are we supposed to tell if a person has the Holy Spirit by the gifts of the Spirit or by the fruits of the Spirit? Does Jesus say you'll know them by their gifts? Or you know them by their fruits? You know what I think is really interesting? God says He gives the Holy Spirit to them that obey Him. Amen. God gives the Holy Spirit to them that obey Him. And yet I remember a few years ago there was just a whole kaleidoscope of charismatic ministers that were in the headlines. They got into different kinds of trouble that we're not going to talk about. And all of them spoke in tongues. I also thought it was interesting that when they traveled to foreign countries they would take an entourage with them and I've seen it on TV they always had translators there that they paid to translate their sermons and I thought if you got the gift of tongues why do you need a translator? Well I mean you'd see, think the 
Tongues 101 would be at least be able to preach to the people who were there like the apostles did, right? This is very suspicious and friends please don't see this as an attack. Uh, this is not offense, this is defense. I'm afraid because I see it encroaching among our people and among our churches and it's just spreading and it is a counterfeit gift. This is the evidence of Babylon and I'd like to make an appeal. I've got friends out there, I used to worship with these people and they say, Pastor I got spoken in tongues, it feels so good, I know what it's like, how can you tell me it's not real? I'm not denying that it's real. I'm saying it's coming from the wrong source. Some of it might be self-induced, sometimes your mind can play games on your own body. Some of it might just be plainly another spirit and the wrong spirit. And don't forget the devil, if he does anything well, he tries to masquerade as messengers of Christ. And I had more than one person who said, Pastor Doug, when I heard this message, even though I spoke in tongues, I said, this makes sense biblically. Lord, if I'm doing something and this is not according to your will, take it away from me. I know an Adventist minister right now, prayed that prayer, used to speak in tongues. And he said it went away and never came back. Of course he wasn't a minister back then. He is now. God just took it away from him. A lot of people have told me that. You just say, Lord, if this is not from you, I want to go by the Bible. And if you follow the Bible, you're safe. And you know what, what the, the bottom line is, friends? Whenever you're in doubt about what to do, who is our example? Who is, who is a Christian supposed to follow? Jesus. Please tell me what verse it was where Jesus spoke in tongues. Show me a verse in the Bible where Jesus slapped someone on the head and they fell down when he healed them. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be derogatory now, but there's a whole lot of things that are being done in Jesus' name now that Jesus didn't endorse. And if the idea that you've got to speak in tongues to prove that you've got the Holy Spirit is the antithesis of what the Bible preaches. And yet, I've been at these services before where someone's sincere, they come forward and they say, I want God in my life, I want the Holy Spirit. And they say, you've got to speak in tongues. And all of my charismatic friends would get around them and they'd all start to pray and they'd shout and they'd beat the drums and, and they'd lay their hands on this person, they'd shake them. And sometimes they'd even take their hands and push in their diaphragms and say, do this. And if they didn't start speaking in tongues then, then they'd say, say hallelujah. Keep saying hallelujah and they go hallelujah, hallelujah and they say faster, hallelujah, hallelujah, faster, faster and they're pushing on their stomach and pretty soon they're babbling. And they say that's it. I said what do you call that? And they go, well we're priming the pump of the Holy Spirit so that living water can flow. They call it priming the pump. Friends, that ain't right. And you know what breaks my heart is I've got friends that were sincerely looking for God. They went to the service, they tried to speak in tongues and they couldn't and they left dejected, they never went back and they said you know I tried and I guess God just had rejected me, I couldn't do it. They were sincere, they weren't going to fake it. And so it didn't happen to them and they, and they turned away from God altogether because they couldn't you know, manufacture this counterfeit version of tongues. That's why I'm preaching it. Because I don't want people to be discouraged by this, I don't want people to be distracted, I don't want you to be confused in the last days, what did I read to you? Every uncouth thing is going to come into the church, even among God's people. And with the confusion and the bedlam and the cacophony and the drums and the dancing, all that's going to be coming in. And if we're not aware of what the Bible says, that God says all things should be done decently and order, and whatever you're in doubt about what to do, you do what Jesus did and you're safe, friends. You believe that? Why does God give us the gift of tongues? that we might tell about Jesus. And I pray for the gift of tongues, the real gift. Just empowers you more and more to be able to talk to other people. I, I think I shared with you one time, I was driving across Demi, New Mexico. I picked up a Mexican hitchhiker who spoke no English. I had just prayed God would give me the ability to witness to somebody. And when I picked up this hitchhiker, I thought, that's great. But he didn't understand me. I said, Lord, you got a sense of humor. My Spanish back then was, you know, you could order at a restaurant. That was about it, a Spanish restaurant. And, and uh, I prayed. I said, Lord, I need the gift of tongues because I was driving from Demi, New Mexico to Northern California and it was going to take two days in this old truck. I said, this is going to be a long trip. I'd like to talk to him about you, Lord. He said he wanted to come and do some work for me. And I said, sure, I got firewood business and 
I, you know, friends, I don't know how it happened along the way. First, I started making up words. I just thought that in Spanish, you know, you just add the word O or A uh <laughs> to an English word. And I said, I'm driving my truck -o up to the mountains, O, <laughs> and uh, to do work, O. And, uh, and you know, if words started coming back to me because I had heard some along the way. You know, I lived in New York City and I went to school with my Puerto Rican friends and then I went to school in California with my Mexican friends and I went to school in Miami with my Cuban friends. And somewhere along the way I heard those things and Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will bring things to your remembrance. And words started coming to me. And the next thing I knew, I'm riding down the road, I'm saying, tu quieres come vivo conmigo en trabajo en la montaña, si yo cortar leña. And he goes, ah, oh, you know, guys. One time I, I wanted to know if he was hungry. I said, tu quieres dinero? I meant dinner, you know, dinero. And that meant money. And he got very excited. <laughs> so the reason I'm telling you this story is the closest thing I've ever had to the gift of tongues was that trip. By the time we got to Northern California, he and I were talking. He lived with us. His name was Omar Ayon. He got baptized after living with us six months. And I learned a lot of Spanish working with Omar, let me tell you. I, I speak a lot more when I have to. <laughs> Just enough to get by. But this is what it's all about. is for the purpose of telling others about Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that the message shared today has been given in the Spirit of Christ and that uh, people listening, if, if they've been at all offended, I, I pray they'll forgive the messenger and their hearts will be open to the message that will realize that there is a truth and there are also counterfeits out there we need to be aware of. Lord, I pray that each person can better understand your word and what it really means to speak with the tongues of angels. Bless us, Lord, that you might touch our tongues with the Holy Spirit and that we might speak your words. And I pray that you will set a hedge of truth about us to protect us from the, the absolute blizzard of deceptions that are coming to your people. Help us to take our stand based on thus saith the Lord. Be with us, Lord, as your people. And we thank you again for the good news and the truth that sets us free. We ask these things in the name of him who is the truth, Jesus our Lord. Amen. A website whose roots date back to the beginning of time, SabbathTruth.com is the definitive resource for Bible light on the Lord's Day. Clear Bible answers for every question you've ever had about the Sabbath. Seven key topic headings guide you through the purpose of the Sabbath, which day is the Lord's Day, the Sabbath and prophecy, questions about the Sabbath, how to keep it holy, the Sabbath and history, and many Sabbath resources. Visit SabbathTruth.com today and share your newfound treasure with a friend.